Great. Well, I think we've got we've got um, who we'll have for now, and folks can just join us as they're able. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Caitlin Cusack. I'm a forester with the Vermont Land Trust, and I'm here to welcome you to Wildlife on the Move, protecting landscape connections one parcel at a time. I will be, in, in addition to Catherine Hancock, who is our AmeriCorps member, Catherine and I will be the behind the scenes, uh, dealing with any tech questions that may come up, uh, as well as I'll, I'll be moderating some of the questions at the end. Um, so feel free if you do have any Zoom related uh, issues to just uh, chat, use the chat box uh, to connect with Catherine and I. So just a couple Zoom housekeeping things before we get going. I know most folks have probably been doing a lot of Zooming in the last several months, um, but just a quick review for maybe any uh, newcomers. If you uh, look at the bottom of your screen, you will see uh, kind of hover over the bottom, uh, some icons will pop up, one that says participants, one that says Q&A, another says chat. And so we're going to be asking that as questions come up, if you can use the Q&A function by clicking on that and enter your question in there, um, that will be the easiest way for us to keep track of them. The To the right of Q&A is the chat box, and that's where you can enter uh, enter greetings as John Card has done to say hi to everybody um, or other comments. But if you could try and enter the questions in the Q&A, that just is a little bit easier for us to keep track of. Um, and so I think we'll, we'll jump into that as long as everyone's all set and nobody has any other Zoom related questions. Uh, I just want to welcome uh, two of our presenters today we're lucky to have with us. Uh, Kim Royer, who is a wildlife biologist uh, with the Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife, and Bob Heiser, who is a regional direct director with the Vermont Land Trust. So I will turn it over to both of them. And as I said, we will we'll take questions at the end, but please feel free to enter your questions as they come up in the Q&A and we'll, we'll hopefully get to those. Uh, another couple of things actually I did just wanna mention, we are recording this. Um, so if for some reason you have to hop off uh, before we're over, uh, before we end, this will be uploaded to our YouTube um, channel. All right, with that, Kim, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Caitlin and, and Bob and Catherine. So I'll be starting the presentation. I'll, I'll do the first half and then I'm going to turn it over to Bob and I'll talk quite a bit about wildlife movement in Vermont. I'm going to focus on the animals and then Bob's going to sort of hone in on uh, specific projects, Shootsville Hill. So we're really talking about um, wildlife movement and, and how do animals get from one place to another. And why should we be concerned about this? Why are we concerned about wildlife connectivity? Well, as we lose uh, habitat, as we convert forest to non-forest, and, and as the climate heats uh, warmer each decade, uh, wildlife and actually humans as well, um, we actually will depend on our, our health and our well-being, and the populations of these animals are gonna depend on an ecologically resilient landscape. Um, over time. And this is a landscape that allows wildlife, uh, wide ranging species to move from one place to another for seasonal food resources. It allows for the dispersal of young. Um, it allows for plants and animals uh, to colonize new habitats. Uh, it allows for movement upslope in the face of a warming climate uh, without animals having to go through uh, you know, in de developed type habitats, and it allows for genetic exchange, which is really critical. So we all hey, probably- Hey, Kim. Yeah. Can I just pause you for a minute? Your sure. your sound is a little choppy. Um, so I'm wondering Please. if, could you try maybe turning off your video and see if that might improve it? For sure, yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me just- Pull this up. I'm sorry. That that's never really happened. No. Yeah. It's uh, kind of it's kind of funny. Uh, kind of funny sounding. But try try turning off your video and then. Yeah, I'm actually just trying. Oh, there it is. Okay. So let me just shut that. Um, okay. Does that does that help? Testing one two. That sounds good to me, folks. And just type in the chat. Does that does that sound better? Okay. Liz <laughs> says better. Okay. We're okay, good. Great, Thank great. you. Thank you, yeah. Kim. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. Well, I'm glad there. you stopped me. No, that's fine. Thanks. Okay. So, 
I'm sure most people on the call are aware of some of the most significant threats to wildlife um, in Vermont and actually around the world. Uh, we've talked a lot um, and, and people hear a lot about habitat loss and fragmentation, certainly climate change, um, but also things like invasive exotic species and, and pollution and sedimentation. And, and an ecologically functional landscape would help to mitigate uh, some of these threats that, that are here now, but are probably gonna be increasing as, as we go into the future. And also uh, we know that there are some direct impacts related to roads and we can mitigate those impacts as well uh, by being very strategic about where we place our bridges and culverts. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as I go forward. Okay, now it's not advancing, that's weird. On. Okay, there we go. So what are the impacts of roads and fragmentation on wildlife? And, and most of us probably intuitively can understand how development and roads might affect uh, wildlife movement on a terrestrial landscape, but we often don't think about the effects of things like culverts on our, our aquatic organisms passage. And you can see from the slide on the right here um, that this, this perched culvert is actually isolating the population below the culvert from the population above the culvert. So it's actually isolating, uh, the, it's in, impacting genetic exchange between those two populations um, and influencing the way those species historically might have used that stream. Uh, we all have seen direct mortality on roads, so we all understand that. Um, but we may not think about the, the change in species composition, both vegetative composition. So when you put a development in or you convert the forest to some non-forest, you're going to see vegetative changes in composition, which is going to result in changes in species composition. Species like raccoons and opossums are much more adaptable to suburban type habitats uh, than maybe wide ranging species like black bear and, and, and bobcat. Um, so we're gonna also see from that conversion, perhaps a spread of invasives. Many of you have experienced this with, um, with things like honeysuckle that move into areas where we've done some clearing. And so this affects biodiversity. And what we don't think about a lot is it really can alter how we live on the land and the way we, we see the land. So it does affect humans as well as wildlife. The Fish and Wildlife Department's responsible uh, for conserving all fish and wildlife. Um, and this can involve 25,000 different species. So trying to figure out how to protect the habitats and the natural communities of 25,000 species individual by individual is virtually impossible. And so protecting as the Nature Conservancy has coined the phrase, protecting the stage um, may also help to protect the actors. And so this whole approach of uh, protecting large forest blocks and connecting corridors is really dependent on, is really is really an attempt to try to make sure that we protected everything that these different species need going into the future. And, and you, you have to think of this in terms of different spatial scales. A wide ranging species like Fisher or Bobcat are going to have different needs um, from that like a, of, a wood, of a smaller species like a wood turtle. And so we have to think of this uh, for all of these different species on a whole host of different, different scales. So we'll start with the largest scale, and this is, or not, it isn't the largest scale, we could even go out further than this, but we'll, we'll start at the regional scale. And we may not think of Little Old Vermont as being all that important, but it is considered a keystone state. And you can see that from this map, that Vermont actually links the Adirondacks in New York to, to New Hampshire, and the state of Massachusetts to Quebec, Canada. And so maintaining uh, a functional landscape in Vermont is really critical to our neighboring states and actually even our neighboring country. And then if we drill in a little bit further, um, we, we can look at some of these, this is a, an early rendition of sort of the, the large forest block map, but you can sort of identify where there might be some pinch points. And about 30 years ago, um, we noticed that um, the Southern Green Mountain National Forest was actually fragmented from the Northern Green Mountain National Forest um, 
in the area in between, and that's between Route 103, for those of you that are from down south, and Route 4. And what we had was a few state parcels, but a lot of private land in between, including Killington Ski Area and Okemo Ski Area, which suggested that there was going to be a lot of development pressure in that little area in the next 30 years. And so over the past 30 years, working with partners like um, the Conservation Fund and Vermont Land Trust, the Nature Conservancy, we've actually conserved uh, 30,000 acres. Um, and the last parcel, well, one of the last two parcels was actually protected this past year in the town of Mount Holly with, um, with the hard work of Vermont Land Trust and the town of Mount Holly. Um, so we're really excited. And, and that's just one example of of the way that we can create a functional landscape by just trying to link up like a string of pearls, these larger forest blocks. So then you might zoom into a little more of a local perspective. And so this more be, might be more like a town, town perspective. And you first wanna identify where those large forest blocks are. And then you realize, well, okay, there's some, there's some areas where they're not connected to each other uh, so then you identify a habitat connector block. And finally, you identify the, the corridors that connect that habitat connector block, if you can see my cursor, to the forest habitat blocks. And then and you basically then now have a resilient landscape. It doesn't mean that you can't, you can't do some harvesting within those forest habitat blocks, but they are generally blocks that have a minimal amount of um, development um, and little and very little fragmentation, um, but there can be other kinds of activities that occur in those blocks. And then you can you can develop around the habitat connector and the forest habitat blocks as long as you can maintain the connectivity between them all. So, what would a connecting corridor? What are some of the attributes of a connecting corridor? Um, and you first need to identify, as I mentioned, those connecting large forest blocks. You're trying to link those up. And, and for those of you who may not be aware of where those might be locally in your area, you can uh, go to that website that's listed there, um, the fishandwildlife.com, and go to Vermont Conservation Designs, and you'll see a whole report that sort of outlines all of the things I'm talking about. Or you can go to BioFinder. Um, or the the A and R atlas, and you'd be able to locate some of these things. So so you identify those first, and then those could be linked either by riparian corridors, which are basically streams or rivers with buffer strips on them, or often um, wildlife will cross at the heights of land. So if you're on a road and you're driving up uphill and you hit the top, and before you go downhill, those are often the locations of where animals like moose and, and black bear will cross the road. Um, you would also maybe identify where specific types of habitat meet across a road. Well-placed culverts and bridges and um, Caitlin Drasher, who I think is on this call, is, is actually working with VTrans right now uh, as part of her master's and PhD project to identify some of those and prioritize some of those areas. And then where you may have locations of existing human, human infrastructure, and you, you probably cannot set up uh, corridors in areas where you have already have development and or even um, something as, as simple as um, something that might block the highway. So, you know, we're, there's all sorts of ways that you can look at the land, and I'll go through a few of those. Um, so here's a riparian corridor, and this is a river with a buffer. This is this is a beautiful um, wildlife corridor, and trying to maintain those buffers and and create at least 100 to 300 feet on either side of the rivers and streams would help to move wildlife across our landscape and go a long way towards moving wildlife across our landscape. This is an area in the Champlain Valley, obviously, um, quite a fragmented landscape. But you can see on the left side of the screen, there's a forest block here. And you can almost imagine if you were a bobcat, say, in this smaller block or working your way through this riparian corridor here, that you might cross the road right there or right there. 
And you could see also, this is an example of where if we could restore the buffer on this stream here, we could, we could really increase connectivity in this region right here and connect up these two smaller blocks with this smaller block out here. Um, so there's lots of ways to think about how these animals might use the landscape. This is an example of two conserved pieces of land, the Bradford Town Forest on the north side of the road and the Fairley Town Forest on the south side of the road with unprotected land in between. These towns might decide that trying to conserve that white area in between these two conserved areas would be a high priority because you've already got a natural place where animals might cross the road without being impeded by development. And if we, dr if we drilled into that area that I was talking about before, this happens to be Okemo ski area. And you can see just looking at this aerial photo, there's quite a bit of development on this side of the, on this side of the map, the left side, and quite a bit on the right side. And so it would be critically important to actually try to protect that area that crosses, this is Route 103 in Ludlow. And we know that both bear and moose cross here. Um, we have some historical records of that. Um, so what we did when, when Okemo went through an Act 250 to try to build these trails, we tried to keep them all on the Eastern side of the Haida land, which is right here. And then we purchased, um, again, with help of partners, forests and parks included, we purchased the land on the other side of the road. This was already state land here. And so there is now a secure corridor across uh, 103 in Ludlow. Like I mentioned, uh, Wells Place bridges and culverts identifying these sites where we know animals are trying to cross the road, maybe where, where animals are getting hit by a car frequently might be places where when VTrans is planning to do work there, they can put in a structure that's a little more friendly to animals crossing either under or through um, an air at a culvert. And this was the case again, where Caitlin was working with us um, on the, a project where um, an underpass had been put in on Route 9 and there were cameras put up and you can see right in here, this is a, an actual, a picture of a lynx, which is, is pretty, unusual in Southern Vermont. So just to give you some um, examples of how animals might use the landscape, this is, uh, we did a bobcat study uh, partly in the Champlain Valley about 12 years ago. This is one bobcat and, and you don't really need to do much data analysis to get a sense of how the, the points are, the bobcat had a collar and the points are where the bobcat moved through this period of time. And you can see it did not use these open fields very often at all. And when it had to, it actually walked through the hedgerows. So you can see the, the points here and the points here. So that, that the bobcat was actually using some real fine scale habitat to move across the landscape. These, these, actually, these, these areas actually function as corridors for that bobcat through habitats that they tend not to use very often. You can see here, this is Route 7, and this bobcat was using um, this very scrub, shrubby habitat, and you can see there was no other place here for that animal to cross the road. So they were using that scrub, shrubby habitat to um, move across Route 7. Unfortunately, in this case, I think they had to move over the road, um, but, Still, at least they had protection getting up to the road and then scoot across to the other side. This is kind of an interesting slide. Again, you can see how the cat is moving across this road here through this maybe wet swale area. Um, and you'll notice this straight line movement here. And this was something we saw with at least two, or maybe three of the cats. Um, this railroad ran through several of the cat's home ranges and many of them, several of them, actually used the railroad as a way, as a movement carter, as a way to move from one place to the other. And it makes sense when you think there's, there's not a lot of human disturbance on the railroad except when the train comes through, and probably a lot of small mammals as a result of the scrub shrub habitat that's on either side of the tracks. Um, so another way of animals um, using the landscape in unusual ways, actually. 
And then finally for Bobcat, um, this is the La Platte River and this is Route 7. And you can see again, development on both sides of, of the river, but a, a fairly nice riparian corridor that allows for that Bobcat to move uh, from one location, probably a large forest block on the southeast side of this photo, uh, to the northeast part of the um, block. And there's some Nature Conservancy land over up in here. Unfortunately, since uh, this was done, there's been some additional development here. So again, um, some impacts on the habitat that this bobcat was using. And as, as a result of this study, uh, some of the things we found was that, you know, bobcats, as you would imagine, um, travel fairly long distances uh, in a short period of time. So they'll travel an average of 0.8 miles an hour, so almost a mile an hour and can go up to 19 miles in a 24 hour period. Males, because they have larger home ranges, tend to travel faster than females. And they all traveled faster or more during, during evening hours, dawn and dusk primarily. But what I thought was really interesting was that when they went through those, those strips, um, that like those hedgerows, their speed actually increased uh, when they were surrounded by what we might call non-forest habitat. So they were clearly using those strips of habitat that went through the non-forest habitat just as corridors, things that connected them to the habitats that they were actually trying to get to and from. Here's another, um, another interesting part of what we need to look into, and that is that you can see these are these are bobcat road kills over the last uh, since 1999, and you can see that many of those, and primarily most of them, are in the, sort of the Champlain Valley, um, and I think that's partly because we probably have a higher density of bobcats in that region, um, but also maybe because there's more traffic volume um, in on some of the roads in that area. So we'll switch to black bear. Uh, this is a this is a male black bear, um, and he's a he's an adult. And most of his like this was uh, over his four years, like three or four years, I think, of um, his collared life. And this is a this is a study that we we're doing down in southern Vermont, uh, Searsburg. These pink these little pink icons stand for wind towers. And this is a study to determine the impact, the potential impacts of wind energy and the development of those wind towers on black bear use. This happens to be a bear scarred beach stand that's been heavily used over many years by bears as a fall feeding area. And you'll also notice this red line, which is called a virtual fence. And so when the bears go in across that red line into the bear scarred beach stand, uh, their collars were collecting points every 20 minutes. When they were outside of the virtual fence, the collars were picking up points about almost every three hours. So this bear's uh, home range tended to be bounded on all four sides by roads, Route 100, um, Route 9 to the north, and, and um, Route 7 to the, to the west. And he stayed primarily in that home range. However, uh, he did take a foray um, in one year for about, a, for about a month east, almost all the way, to, well, pretty much all the way to Brattleboro. And he passed through the, the beach stand at that point in time, but he did not stay. And this was during the fall and there was relatively good beech nut production that year, but he did not stay. He moved east, um, apparently looking for other food supplies. And um, the question we're trying to figure out is, this was during construction of those, those wind towers. Was that disturbance enough to kick him out of that beach stand? Or um, were there other factors? Maybe the beach nuts weren't quite ripe yet. Uh, we just don't really know, but that's sort of what we're trying to figure out. But the, the point of this is that even bears that tend to stick pretty close to their home range sometimes do take long trips outside of their home range and need corridors and connected habitat to ensure that, that they don't get hit going in and out. This is another um, younger bear, um, hasn't probably established a home range yet. And he started out in this area over here, which was an oak stand. And then between September 23rd and 27,
took a 34, five, 34 mile jaunt. Uh, and you can see he basically went east. He also went through the Bear Scarred Beach stand and also did not stay, even though, again, it was a decent um, beech nut crop. He maybe, because he's a younger bear, could have been kicked out of there because uh, the male bear, if, if the adult bear was there and it, he considered it his territory, he might have kicked this younger bear out. We don't really know, but he eventually turned around and went back to the oak stand again. Oh, actually, he ended, this one ended up in cornfields uh, right at the end of this arrow, the last arrow right there near that number 10. He ended up spending time in cornfields. Now that can be dangerous for bears, as you can imagine, um, because farmers don't appreciate bears eating all their corn. So you can see he spent one day from September 24th at 10, 10 23 to September 25th at 6 20 in the morning, just going through the Bear Scar Beach stand. And so he didn't tarry there. Um, this is the same bear, again, um, starting in the same spot and moving again through um, his territory, or not his territory, but taking a long foray uh, through a huge amount of area. He was crossing on Route 9 right at this yellow, these yellow marks right here, which there's some fidelity to this crossing right here, as well as there's um, an underpass not far to the east, which uh, bears will sometimes use as well. And, um, oops, hang on. And he just ended up trekking north uh, again over about a 10 day period through the large forest block, but also getting into New York state and into some more fragmented habitat, but not spending a lot of time there and eventually heading back to the um, oak stand that he started in. This is the time of life for, for bears and many young wildlife, wide, wide ranging wildlife species where um, it's very dangerous. I, they, can, they can easily get hit by a car when they're making these kinds of forays. This is a female bear, um, and I just this is just an example of her going to the north um, to the Bear Scarred Beach Stands in good beech nut years and heading south into Massachusetts um, when there was a, a bust crop of beech nuts into the oak stands. And again, another female uh, bear with cubs who was spending time on the state land up near um, up near Whitingham. Up, there's a piece of state land called Atherton Meadows here, spending her time there on state and federal land and, and then heading south into Massachusetts to a piece of state land here and into a piece of state land here. And so connecting these up um, would be a, a, a real benefit for many wildlife species. And bears can sort of be the canary in the coal mine for other species as well. Um, this, is, this is an example, and I throw this up because about 30 years ago, if you'd asked me if I'd ever see anything like this, I would have said, no way. These are, these are points taken from a, a collared fisher in, in downtown Albany. And these are, des these are areas where that fisher was moving through pinch points and using these areas, these green areas are col uh, connectivity areas. But this, this fisher is actually functioning in a relatively small area um, in downtown Albany, which, which I find actually quite shocking because they used to be considered deep wood species. And in Vermont here, we still, we still find our densest populations in those large forest blocks. Whether or not this is sink habitat, when you look at it on an aerial photo, it sure looks like this animal couldn't survive here in the long term and that you certainly probably couldn't have a population that survives here in the long term, but um, clearly an adaptable animal that's living in an area that I would never have, have predicted they could live in. And lastly, I'm just gonna um, briefly touch on some work that was done by Dr. Jed Murdoch and one of his students, Cody Aylward, um, to try to try to find out how Martin using both genetic and ecological information, how Martin might move across the landscape. And this is, this is something called circuit theory, which again, Caitlin uh, is going to uh, use to try to help determine where some of these high priority road crossings might be uh, for Vermont 
Agency of Transportation. But this was a map that, that they developed and the yellow shows areas of uh, high connectivity, certainly the Green Mountain National Forest and the Northeast Kingdom areas, and then areas um, in between where it might be more challenging for Martin to move across the landscape. Although we had a Martin that we reintroduced in 1989, end up in um, Rangeley, Maine, eight years later. So clearly they, they made it across the landscape somehow. Um, so these animals are resilient. So just to close, I just wanna, again, just summarize by saying that, you know, when we maintain functional habitat for wildlife and connectivity, um, we're not only maintaining sustainable wildlife populations, but we are also benefiting humans. Um, and those of us who have lived in Vermont through COVID, I think really have found uh, being able to get outdoors and spend time outdoors either alone or with our neighbors has been a real benefit uh, through this very difficult time. And so I think it's really, it's really made us understand the value of how important our forests are and our, our, our outdoors are to our own um, sense of well-being. Uh, so, and it's also um, good economics. So um, I will then turn it over to um, you and to Bob to talk a little bit more about more, a more specific corridor that's been being worked on. Great, thank you, Kim. Sure. Um, that was great. And I will try to share my screen. Um, and while Bob's getting that set up, I just remind everyone, um, bring the questions on and if you could put them in the Q&A, that would be the ideal for, place for them and we'll make sure we have some time at the end to, to get to them. Okay, thanks, Bob. Great. Um, so, uh, as everybody, hopefully people are seeing my um, slides. If not, please let me know. But um, so what we thought we would do is just give you an example of partners working um, across the state to protect some of these really critical um, wildlife habitat linkages and uh, give you a glimpse of um, one example called the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor. Um, and just to give you a sense of where we are, um, I'm gonna zoom way out. And this is looking um, at the Northern Appalachian and Acadian region. So including um, from the West, um, the Tug Hill Plateau, uh, starting West of the Adirondacks and continuing all the way through Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, and up into Canada and all the way East to Nova Scotia. And this is the project area of the Staying Connected Initiative. And that's a, partnership of I think over 60 partners now um, looking to um, maintain the um, function of this very large landscape. Um, and even within this huge landscape, there are areas and that you see these colored um, areas that are really high priorities for connecting this entire landscape. And you can see that Vermont has several of them um, either entirely within Vermont or overlapping into Vermont. And a colleague of Kim's, uh, Jens Hilke, who's very involved in staying connected and also in the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor project, um, he has used this map to just show how Vermont is really at a crossroads um, in this big connected landscape. And whenever I've seen him use this slide, I've always wanted to put Shootsville on it, which is right there. Um, so uh, it, we're really, um, Shootsville is really right in the heart of this connected landscape. And to zoom in a little bit um, to show you where it's located, this is right on the Stowe Waterbury line. And so to the north, you see Stowe Village. To the south, you see um, Waterbury Center and Waterbury Village. And these green blocks um, are, as Kim was just showing, um, the largest and highest priority interior forest blocks in Vermont. So on the west, you have this Mount Mansfield block that's on the order of something like 70,000 acres and connects to more forest land going all the way up into Canada. And on the east, you have the Worcester Range. And I think that's on the order of 45,000 acres and connecting to more forest land going on to the Northeast Kingdom. Um, and then in the middle here, you have what is really the last ecologically viable connection between that block of the Green Mountains and the Worcester Range. Um, and 
it's somewhat unique, I think, for one of these landscape scale efforts where a lot of partners are focusing their attention in that um, it's not a huge area, uh, but because it's forming this link between these huge blocks, um, it's really a critical area and one that has outsized impacts um, in its function and outside of risk if it becomes um, further degraded because there is a fair amount of development pressure here. This is Route 100 that runs right through the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor, um, which we've roughly outlined in yellow here to represent the, the area of the corridor. Um, so there is uh, development pressure and Route 100, um, as Kim was saying, uh, with roads being um, obviously potential barriers to wildlife movement, that's um, a potential barrier in the middle of this corridor. So going back, um, over a decade, uh, there was a study in Vermont looking at the highest um, priority crossing areas along roads and uh, called critical paths. And uh, the National Wildlife Federation and US, I mean, Vermont Fish and Wildlife um, hired an independent ecologist, Jesse Moore, to take a look at some of those highest priority crossing areas. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in that study, the Shootsville Hill, what we now call the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor, was identified as, um, in his words, you know, irreplaceable and one of the um, highest priorities in the state. And so there was an effort to bring this into people's consciousness, the importance of road crossings in general, but also um, the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor specifically. Um, and so there was a press event here and famously as the press was getting out of that, were getting out of their cars, um, a moose walked across the road um, and the local partners carried this effort to keep the information flowing to the public um, about the importance of this corridor. Um, the Waterbury Conservation Commission and Stowe Land Trust started hosting these um, Shootsville wildlife series um, that often were either focused on single species or conservation issues um, that uh, almost all of them would easily just also highlight the importance of the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor. Um, and so uh, about five years um, ago, there was, <clears throat> excuse me, an, an effort to bring um, the partners back together and see if we could um, kind of rejuvenate the energy and take next steps of figuring out how we can protect the function of this corridor. And over that same time period, um, our statewide planning and prioritization of conservation efforts had evolved, you know, to looking, continuing to look past these big blocks um, to prioritize the, those areas connecting these big blocks. And not surprisingly, the Chutesville Hill Wildlife Corridor jumped out as one of the highest priorities in the state. And that's the orange blob you're seeing there in the middle. Um, and zooming in a little more, I just show you on the east and west of this corridor, the lightest color green here is um, state land. So there are, is some secure forest land on either side of this corridor. And then within the yellow boundary, we have both interior forest and connecting forest land that um, <clears throat> is critically important to connecting these two pieces of state land. So during the time we were getting together, um, at the beginning, there was this proposal for a, um, a cell tower on uh, top of what's known as North Hill. And this is right in the middle of the corridor. And there are some concerns about um, the impact of the road that would be necessary and potential fragmentation and, um, and potential further development if, if a road would develop there. And while the partners were not directly involved um, as a partnership in this issue, what it helped do was draw attention to the importance of the Chutesville Hill Wildlife Corridor within the local communities, um, even more than it had been on the radar. Um, and the state actually ended up um, not approving it as proposed and in a large uh, part due to the wildlife habitat connectivity and the importance um, that the corridor has. So the, the partners, um, both our local partners and statewide, um, Stowe Conservation Commission, Waterbury Conservation Commission, Stowe Land Trust, Vermont Land Trust, the Nature Conservancy, the Regional Planning Commissions, and um, the State Department of Fish and Wildlife, Forest and Parks, and Agency of Transportation. 
and we were getting together to basically try to come up with strategies to protect the function of this corridor. Um, and these are the primary strategies we landed on. Um, first of all, permanent conservation and working with those landowners interested in conserving their land, um, working with municipalities and the regional planning commissions to incorporate the importance of the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor um, into their plans, um, both locally and regionally and, and potentially zoning as another avenue for protecting the corridor. Uh, and then working with individual landowners as far as um, their uh, management of the property and giving them either direct technical assistance assistance or um, sources of information to help them manage their lands in ways that um, would facilitate use by wildlife and, and wildlife habitat connectivity. And then um, thinking about what enhancements could be done and could we help influence to um, both the Route 100 corridor uh, and um, remaining roads throughout the corridor to make them as permeable as they can be to wildlife passage. Um, and then Finally, you know, again, making sure that the public is aware of the importance of this corridor and that really supporting all of these other strategies. So um, we started in, in earnest on getting more public information out. You can see on the top left, we had several walks on properties in the corridor. Um, and then moving clockwise, you know, we continued the Shootsville Hill corridor speaker series. And um, the local partners had some great local events. You can see down in the bottom left, um, there's, uh, this was a great uh, activity for kids where kids were either identified as animals or cars and would go up to these buckets and find out if, if they were an animal, they would go up and find out if they were stumbling across a forested riparian buffer and could continue on or something like a road or a or lights and a barking dog and would have to go back and figure out another route. Um, and then on the bottom right, um, there were there, we had a photo contest within the corridor. And this, along with um, some articles in local newspapers, we we're trying to get the word out um, even more than had been done in the past to support our other efforts. Um, and uh, we also partnered with a UVM undergraduate um, group who did uh, some tracking and camera study work to to help us find out what species are using the corridor and where. Um, and that has kind of blossomed into a larger camera study that we have going right now, where we have cameras out on some of the um, landowners' properties in the corridor and, and those in the highest priority areas. Um, again, to, to both learn more about what animals are using the corridor, but also um, really to help inspire us and people who live in the corridor to know what animals are using it um, and also to kind of encourage folks to to manage for their continued use of the property. So a lot of these efforts have led to, I think, some great outcomes in the last five years in the corridor. Um, first, the corridor is highlighted in both town plans of Stowe and Waterbury, both in the um, their maps and in their text. Um, in, uh, in these communities, we were able to raise a little over half a million dollars um, that we called the Catalyst Fund because our hope was that we'd be able to use these funds to conserve somewhere between three and five properties was our hope to help kind of inspire further conservation in the, in the corridor. And so as a result of a lot of generous um, community members, we were able to raise these funds um, and, and look to have active conservation in the corridor. Um, at the same time, we were trying to think through with limited resources, where are the priorities even within this corridor? So we took some of those approaches that are done at the state level and kind of tailored them for a, a finer scale analysis of the land within the corridor to find out which properties would likely be most important to maintaining connectivity through this landscape. And um, it incorporated a lot of what Kim was talking about, about not only avoiding the built landscape, but looking for um, areas, riparian areas and highlighting those, um, ridge lines uh, and areas with forested cover on either sides um, of the road as key crossing areas. So that white, um, area, kind of whitish purple, is the area that we consider to be those areas um, the most likely to maintain this connectivity for wildlife. Um, and it's a little more purple in this slide that shows uh, the Kelly green or represents conserved land 
in the corridor. Um, and I think, and the, the red outlined ones are the ones that have been conserved in the last couple years or so. Um, and I think what's great about the work that's been done in the last couple of years is not only does it kind of stretch along the whole um, breadth of the corridor, but it, these parcels really represent the diversity of um, different ways land can add to this um, the functioning of this corridor. On the far west, you have a 300 acre property with a lot of shared boundary with the state land. Um, and that landowner, um, those landowners generously donated a conservation easement on about 300 acres to Vermont Land Trust. Um, and then a little bit to the north of that is uh, 100 acres that has frontage on Route 100 at a critical crossing area. And that landowner generously sold a conservation easement to Vermont Land Trust for significantly less than the appraised value. Um, and just south of that, there's a smaller parcel that is at this critical crossing area where locals, it, if a local has seen a moose on Route 100, there's a fair chance it was right there at that crossing location. And the Nature Concert Conservancy actually acquired that land outright um, and, um, and owns it. And then moving further east, there's a parcel that looks kind of like a, a arrowhead um, right in the center of the slide. And that is where the, um, the tower was proposed. And again, that landowner um, generously sold a conservation easement less than appraised value. So that parcel on North Hill is um, conserved. And then on the far east, Stowe Land Trust worked with this landowner to add land to the um, CC Putnam State Forest. So it's shaded the same color there. Um, bring it down into the corridor. So really a lot of great conservation work that I think is a direct um, result of a lot of that public outreach uh, that was led by the, the local partners. Um, we've also been working with uh, landowners on um, helping them to, to know options for managing their land to facilitate movement of wildlife and, and wildlife habitat. And here's Andrea Shortsleeve with from our fish and wildlife working with some landowners and also gave some talks that in the evening and we hope to do more of that going forward. Um, so in this last slide, I'm just gonna talk over this video that doesn't have any sound, but um, this was uh, when we went on a site visit to the, the site where the, um, the property where the tower was proposed. Um, we looked up and caught this uh, bear and two cubs climb in the tree. Um, and it's just a great outcome that this property is conserved and will continue to be great habitat and a great place for a uh, corridor for wildlife habitat and uh, wildlife movement. Um, so the partners are now after this kind of first phase of conservation and outreach um, and work with towns, uh, kind of relooking at our strategic plan and thinking um, to, uh, ahead towards the next three years and um, it's a very exciting time and just some some great outcomes on the in the corridor. So with that, I will open it up to questions and I'll stop sharing so we can see folks. Awesome. Thanks so much, Bob. Thanks so much, Kim, for uh, really fascinating slides and and information. Um, so we've had a, we have a bunch of questions uh, coming in. And so let's uh, kick it off with a question from Stuart, um, which Kim uh, goes back to your presentation. And Stuart's wondering, is there a minimum length of a uh, quote habitat connector along a sort of dirt road, a back road that's su sufficient for wildlife passage? Oh, Kim, you're you're still muted. And, and actually, can you hear me now? I'm, I apologize for the, the technical issues with the sound. Is it is it okay right now? That's Yeah, that's much clearer, Kim. Great. I don't, I don't understand what happened. But anyway, um, so thanks for the question, Stuart. I guess I would say um, it depends. And it depends on the species and, and uh, what is going on on either side of that dirt road. For black bears, we, we had used to sort of try to protect about uh, at least 800 feet, uh, an eighth or you know upwards of an eighth to a an eighth to a quarter of a square mile. I don't think you need that on a dirt road necessarily, especially if it's not a heavily developed dirt road. Uh, it would depend on how much traffic was on the dirt road, and if it's something like a bobcat, uh, bobcats will move across a road like that in a hedgerow. But if you're looking to protect um, sort of the the suite of species that might use 
that dirt road. I would look for areas that we, both Bob and I talked about, areas where there's not a lot of development, maybe a height of land or a stream crossing, and um, try to protect upwards of at least 300 feet on either side of the stream crossing or three or 400 feet on either side of the height of land um, to try to maintain the corridor into the future for as many species as possible. Super, thanks, thanks, Kim. Um, and Stuart, I see you have uh, some other questions and I'm gonna kind of cycle through some other folks, but don't worry, I'll, I'll come back to your, your others. Um, so a question from Nancy, has Route 7 seen any crossing improvements over the last 12 years? Traffic has only increased in the past decade. Uh, you mean from an infrastructure standpoint? Bob, you may know, given that you're in the Champlain Valley. Um, I don't know offhand. Yeah, in I, I, it sounds like um, the question is about whether VTrans has put in any improved infrastructure on Route 7. I assume, I assume that's what it is, but Nancy, feel free to clarify uh, by kind of typing in the chat if there's uh, more and, to that question. And maybe what I would say, and, and I don't know if Caitlin Drasher wants to weigh in on this, but I think part of what Caitlin's project is hopefully going to do um, will be to try to identify some of those crossings like along Route 7 where VTrans could put in put could invest in putting in some special structures that allow for wildlife crossings safely. But I don't I'm not aware what yeah I, I'm not aware right now of of things that have happened in the last 10 years or 20 years. Okay, super. Thanks, Kim. And that just clarifying from Nancy that she was wondering about AOT work. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I will say that that Vermont's AOT department is is pretty progressive um, compared to a lot of other states, and have worked pretty closely with a lot of organizations, as Bob suggested, to try to mitigate some of the the um, fragmentation issues that that highways and roads cause. Great. Thanks, Kim. Um, so a, a question from Karen is about the, and there are actually a couple of questions about that, the bear walkabout um, that, that you shared about. And that's a question from Karen about that is, was the fall of 2017 a bad year for beech nuts? Would scarcity of the nuts have contributed to length of time the bear remained in the beech grove? And then a follow-up, Jason was wondering about that same situation. Could mating behavior have described that as another uh, so I'm just going back. I think the fall of 17 was a okay year for beech nuts. Um, and yeah, it was a good beech nut year. And that's why it was unusual. I think both of those bears, those male bears, went into the bear scarred beach stand, but didn't stay. And the question that we have is there was active construction going on in that bear scarred beach stand at the time that both bears passed through there. And we would have assumed that normally that's where they would have ended up feeding. Um, so we don't know whether that foray out of their home ranges actually was a result of the fact that there was construction going on in that um, in the wind tower area or, or whether it had to do with breeding behavior or it had to do with competition between the males or uh, you know, some other factor. And that's, that's exactly what that research effort is going to try to find, find out. But those are great questions, because that's exactly what we need to know. Super. Thanks, Kim. And I'm seeing uh, in the chat from Caitlin. Yeah, sorry, Caitlin, there, I'm, we're not able to unmute um, participants right now. Uh, actually, you know what I can do? Uh, Catherine, can we promote Caitlin for a second to a panelist and then just have her share? It's just a follow-up, Kim, yes. to what you were chatting about. Uh, Caitlin, hang on one second. We're going to promote you to panelists, and then you'll be able to share it. So while we're doing that, why don't I throw out another question, and then, Caitlin, you can chime in. So um, MW is wondering, Kim, with that fisher, I'm assuming it's the fisher example in Albany, was that yeah. fisher preying on, on house cats? It wouldn't surprise me. I don't have that information. That was Dr. Roland Case who did that research in New York. Um, but I mean, I'm sure that Fisher was preying on whatever species tend to live in and among 
in, in and among city type habitats or sort of suburban type habitats. And it very much could have been house cats, um, could have been things like, you know, rats and stuff like that. I don't really know, um, but they're somewhat opportunistic as long as it's a, a small, you know, rabbit sized animal, um, that's, that's fair game for Fisher. Super. Thanks, Kim. So we've got Caitlin sort of with us now. So Caitlin, if you can unmute yourself and you want to uh, follow up Hi. to Hi. to the question. There we are. Okay, here she is. Sorry to put you on the no, not see Caitlin. Great presentation. And thanks for the uh, shout outs to our project with VTrans. Um, just going back to the transportation side of things, we are currently trying to identify parts of the landscape, um, sort of from this broad landscape scale movement perspective of wildlife, where wildlife are most likely to cross the road uh, throughout the road network. And then from there, we want to zoom in on existing transportation structures that would um, sort of be the highest priority to make wildlife improvements for. So since funding is extremely limited um, in Vermont for these types of things. We, we kind of want to focus on the structures we already have um, and figure out which one of those structures are, or ones of those structures are um, highest priority to make improvements for. But that being said, this information will be available. So if they do um, consider putting in a new transportation structure somewhere for wildlife, they would be able to reference this information uh, to pick an area that would be the most useful for a certain species or a set of species, if that makes sense. That's great. Okay, thanks, Caitlin. And maybe we'll just we'll just keep you here if that's okay with you in case any other transportation questions uh, come up. Okay. So just uh, kind of working down the list here. Um, Paul is wondering, Kim, are you optimistic of Martin increasing their numbers in genetic diversity in Vermont? Well, I would say in the face of climate change, it's going to be challenging. I, I mean, as most of you probably know, uh, Martin and lynx are two species that are tied to deep, fluffy snow uh, in order to outcompete Fisher and Bobcat. And um, my hope is that they're going to be successful. I mean, we actually thought the reintroduction had failed in southern Vermont. And um, we have found out in recent years, 20 years later, that, that we do have a core population in Southern Vermont and we have a small population in Northern Vermont. Um, but whether or not those two populations can survive in the long term, I think will depend on both connectivity, but also on uh, resilience in the face of climate change. Super, thanks, Kim. Um, so John, sort of going back to the, the bear beach tree wind farm study. Um, John is wondering, has that been completed? And if so, uh, were its results, what were its results and how will this impact future wildlife habitat decisions? If it is not completed, you know, when, when is that expected to, the study expected to be done? Yeah, no, it's not quite completed. I think the field work is primarily done, finished, uh, but, but the analysis has not been done yet. And um, I expect probably by this time next year, there may be a report available. Okay. And I mean, I, I think we'll hope to use the information um, to influence how, you know, how we, how we address proposals for additional wind farms, especially wind farms. In this case, this was an unusual site because we had a heavily used bear scarred beach stand. And the question is, will the bears still utilize that bear scarred beach stand uh, in, in years where we have good nut production, even in the face of having the wind towers up there. That's really what we're hoping to find out. Great, thanks, Kim. And just a follow-up question to, to that situation from John is, you know, when a bear takes such a long trek, as you showed in your slides, uh, many miles over several days, how did they find their way back um, to the primary <laughs> feeding area right without retracing their steps? Because they're way smarter than we are, I guess. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, that, I, I don't know. They just have a way of knowing where they are in the landscape. And I guess I don't know. If, does anybody know the answer to that? Um, I don't know. They, they're just able to, they are, they're able to know 
I, I don't know whether they smell like if they're going to say beech nuts or oak stands, I, I, they have an amazing sense of smell. And I th suspect that in some ways they can actually smell these areas. There's also some fidelity to these mast areas, these mast stands that the female took them there when, she, when they were cubs, uh, they can find their way back again. Um, but how they, how they must have an internal compass when they take a large foray like that, uh, you know, I'm not sure how they find their way back. Cool. Um, great. Uh, so question from Bill, is it better to open up an old overgrown apple orchard or leave it be? Um, I, I would say be, be great to open it up. They, when they're, when they're shaded, they don't produce apples. And, uh, so if you release those apple, apple trees and if they've been shaded for a long time, you may want to like may want to do it over a period of years, but um, with some sunlight, they might start producing apples again, which is a really valuable food source when there's not a lot of beech nuts and acorns available. There's That's lots great. of people also who could, could provide assistance in that. I mean, lots of foresters, lots of wildlife biologists who could provide assistance on how best to do that. That's great, thanks, Kim. Um, and and I know some of those are on the call. So if you know of any of those resources, I'd say feel free to type them in the chat for folks. Um, so a question from Anne. Uh, Anne lives in Jericho and seems to have a small corridor behind her home that uh, she has a hammer camera set up in. It is it is due to it is due to a protected area maintained by the Jericho Underhill Land Trust. She's recorded eighteen of Vermont's listed mammal species this year. Wow. Would there be any value in reporting that data? And if yes, to whom? Uh, I, I, I think it would be of interest to, to us at least. And maybe, maybe Jens, Bob, do you think might be the person to report that to? Um, and I, Anne, if you email me, um, I can forward your information to the right person. Um, Cause there yeah. may be other people in the area, other, you may, maybe the town is interested as well. Go ahead, Bob. That's exactly what I was going to say is um, in addition to that, uh, Jericho Underhill Land Trust, and you may have um, given them that information already, but they might be very interested in the both the information and the photos. And right. then the Town Conservation Commission, I'm guessing, would be very interested. Okay, great. Thanks. And we'll, we'll send a follow-up email after this with the link to the recording, and we'll also include Kim and Bob's contact information for folks mm -hmm. in that. So thanks, Ann, for that. Um, question. So a question from Jed, was there much resistance to, to the development of riparian buffers? And if so, how did you handle that resistance? Likewise, what ways did you persuade people to conserve their land? Um, and, and this is, I guess, specific to that 30,000 acres, probably Jed's asking. Um, I mean, there is, you know, right, people, it's really, it's very difficult to protect a 50 foot buffer on some of these riparian areas um, to say nothing of 100 or 300 feet. Um, and, and you guys, all you have to do is travel the roads of Vermont and you'll see many of our rivers and streams are already impacted uh, by the existing infrastructure that's there. So that is a challenge. Um, and you know, there's a lot of effort now to try to maintain river corridors, uh, you know, so that rivers can go back to the kind of sinuous uh, sort of um, movement that they used to have before, before you know, a lot of our rivers were actually channelized. Um, and that even takes more room. Uh, so that is a challenge and it's, it's something we can work towards, all of us, I think, uh, in, our, in our respective towns, uh, but it's not easy. And then um, I guess the second part of that question was, uh, Caitlin, yeah, so the second part, likewise, what ways did you persuade people to conserve their oh, land? Yeah, um, we worked with some local, I mean, and this is probably the same way, maybe Bob, you want to talk about that too. I mean, we, you know, we worked with some local uh, organizations who, um, who were willing to put easements on their property, some, some for payment and some for, um, some some donations and you know i think part of it is like bob said when you have the plan in your head of what you're trying to accomplish then as those properties come up for sale 
you're in a position to try to actually um, take advantage of that. And so some of it is by, by just working on a person by person basis and other is just, just opportunistically, but maybe Bob, maybe you have something to add to that given the work that you've done in Shootsville. Yeah, I would say all those things are true. And I would say that, um, you know, we find that many, if not most of the landowners in these areas are really interested in the fact that they're part of this larger um, landscape that has such a, a broad reaching impact. Um, and, and there are some cases where we can, there can be direct financial payment to landowners. There are other cases where there are tax benefits or some combination. Um, but in almost every case, um, there's some fundamental um, desire to see that land protected. And, and a lot of these landowners have owned their land for a long time and managed it very carefully. And they want to see that those values continue on. Yeah, and I, I will say um, that town conservation commissions can be really critical because they know the local people. And so if they're motivated and, um, and they're interested in participating, they can do a lot of the legwork on the ground. And they've been very important in some of these conservation efforts. That's great. Thank you both. Uh, great partners. So I think we're going to just pause given, given the time. And uh, Bob, if you don't mind just popping up that slide real quick. Uh, Kim and Bob have agreed to kind of stay on longer to continue answering questions for, for any of you know those if, if folks want to continue to have a Q&A, uh, but I do want to just respect folks' time and we're, we're a little bit after one. Um, so just wanted to thank you all for joining us today. Um, we will be sending a follow-up email, as I said, with a link to the YouTube recording, Kim and Bob's contact information, and some list of other resources will include some, some links to apple pruning. But I appreciate one comment someone did put in the chat that your county forester is a great resource sort of starting place for that type of um, question. So uh, we'll be sending along in that email as well a survey. We do appreciate and take your comments to heart, so please... Please do take about five minutes to fill that out. It helps us improve these. Um, and just a couple upcoming events that might be of interest in January. We have our line of, of events we're scheduling into June, but the next two, one is on hunting and land stewardship. And after that is about our, uh, our new farmer program, the farmland access program, and just learning more about that. For those that have already donated, we appreciate your support um, and would Consider, consider a donation if you haven't already. Um, and again, I just want to thank Kim and Bob for a really um, rich and uh, informative uh, discussion. And uh, thank everyone for joining us. And so for those who want to stay on, we're going to keep kind of working through the questions. And for those that have to leave, uh, thanks again. All right. Um, so let me kind of go back to our, our questions here. Um, and let's see. Okay, so a question from Tom about uh, kind of trees and shrubs, Kim, that you'd recommend that we plant to enhance food supplies for wildlife in the Champlain Valley. Well, I guess the first thing I would say is pick native trees and shrubs. Um, and there's some websites which we could send um, that would help to make that make that determination of what's native and what what is not native but you know anything uh that has berries on it um you know cherry trees um any kind of any kind of berry producing tree will be valuable to wildlife um i, I can actually if you email me i can send you a list that's great kim and you know what we why don't we we'll just put that list in the uh it, a link great. to it in the in the yeah. follow-up email so everybody has that um super thank you uh, a lot so of the invasive issues that we have had are a result of us promoting non-native species for plantings so um you know things we learn a lot science changes over time that's for sure um great thanks kim so question from alan is is kim on the martin slide uh, and I don't know if it would be helpful to pull that up for folks. Alan had a specific question about, does current density refer to habitat quality or the density of, of Martin? Um, so Caitlin, you might have to help me out on this because Alan, um, what I know about um, 
that circuit theory is about what I told you, but let me try to pull up the slide if I can. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, that was a very preliminary map we made, but I can explain it once it's okay. Let me just it's the last one. So uh, hang on. Hmm. Why is that not working? There. Okay. Can you see that? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'll I'll just jump in and try to explain it quickly. Basically, uh, these maps are made using electrical circuit theory, and I am not an electrical engineer. Although there are some great papers that um, explain how this works in the context of connectivity, but basically. With this Martin example, there are two inputs that go into this map. There's one input that is a measure of occupancy or occurrence. Um, so where Martin are most likely to be found in the landscape based on a set of habitat variables. And then um, there's another input that is landscape resistance. So each variable in the landscape, whether it's canopy cover, uh, grass and shrub, um, rivers, things like that. Every variable in the landscape has its own resistance to movement for a specific wildlife species. So what comes out of this map when you combine those two inputs is um, this measure of electrical current density, which is kind of a proxy for the movement probability of a given species. Um, and it also depends on things like the dispersal ability of the species. So I think for this map, we used a 90th percentile dispersal distance for Martin, which was around 20 kilometers. Um, so if, if you don't have a big dispersal window, the, the electrical current isn't going to travel that far from where um, their known locations are versus if you use like 100 kilometers or something like that. But essentially, this is, this is a map showing the probability of movement for, for a given species. So Caitlin, high density would mean th those areas in yellow are areas where movement of martins would be the habitat would allow for for easy movement of martins across the landscape is that is that a correct exactly yeah. yeah there's there's just a higher um probability of movement in those areas because it's easier there's less resistance to that right. electricity in those locations yeah great Okay, wonderful. Thanks, thanks, Caitlin, for that. Um, and so, just want a question from Stewart is uh, about trail development. So, wouldn't it be wise to limit trail development in forest blocks? New trails are being developed for bicycles within forests, which increase hillside erosion as well as wildlife disturbance. In addition, snowmobile trails give coyotes and dogs easy access to harassment of deer in winter. So, yeah, maybe Kim, just like tr recreational trails. What what are the impacts on, uh, to wildlife? You know, again, Stuart, I hate to keep saying this, but it depends. Um, and I think it's really placement of those trails is really critical. Uh, you don't want to put them through critical habitats, wetlands or wintering areas or bear scarred beach stands where there might be additional disturbance uh, during the time of year when wildlife are trying to use those habitats. Um, so it, it, there is potential for, for additional fragmentation, for additional disturbance. Um, and so they they have to be carefully placed. I, I, I think it's really critical that we think about where we put these trails, especially in landscapes where we have forest blocks that are not currently fragmented. Um, so yeah, I think it's a really good point. We wanna connect people to, to wildlife. We wanna connect them to the out of doors. We wanna get people outside. So it's a challenge to try to juggle those, those two objectives um, and do it in a way that has the least impact on many of these more sensitive species. Great, thanks, Kim. Um, so a question from Gary, is, is a 30 to 50 foot riparian buffer still a value as connector habitat? Uh, certainly for some species it would be. Um, I mean, you know, there's two objectives to that riparian habitat. One is to protect, um, aquatic insects and, and aquatic organisms by maintaining cooler stream temperatures. And the other is to allow for wildlife movement. And so species like salamanders and, and um, you know, and turtles are gonna need a wider buffer than just a 30 or, or even a 50 foot buffer. And some species, you know, use upwards of 300 feet. 
less is better than zero, but the wider, the better. I mean, I, but I wouldn't discount uh, movement if you had only like 30 to 50 feet, but that is, that's pretty narrow. Great, thanks. Thanks, Kim. Um, and just a, a question from Christopher about natural impediments to wildlife movement, topography, water bodies, are those considered in planning and implementation of corridor conservation? And if so, how much are they factored into or prioritized when considering connectivity? Hmm. So not human infrastructure, but just natural uh, landscape, uh, potential natural landscape imp impacts. You know, I, I don't, I don't think that we've factored, factored those in ver very significantly. I mean, it seems like the, you know, you could see from some of those bear slides that they get around um, large bodies of water pretty easily and in a pretty short period of time, it doesn't seem to restrict their movements that much. So uh, I, 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 I'm not aware of us factoring that in. Um, I don't know if Bob, you, that came up in the work that you guys were doing. Yeah, a, a couple of things I would just mention about that and I would agree. Um, you know, and I think I saw a question earlier and, and maybe it was um, the same person asking about the Waterbury Reservoir and that did come up in our conversations. But um, I agree with Kim that uh, for many species, um, there are ways around or over, <laughs> um, less likely, but around um, large water bodies like the Waterbury Reservoir, um, but also on a very site specific, when we were looking at key crossing areas, say in the Shootsville Hill area, we were kind of taking, trying to take an inventory of, um, you know, were areas forested on both sides, but also were there cliff sections or things that just like made it not really suitable for a, a lot of type of um, wildlife habitat movement. Yeah, that's, I think cliffs are, yeah, they are one thing I can think of that, that we thought might impede movement. Great, thank you. Um, just a couple of comments here. One, Alice just wanted to share that for landowner education and conservation, she recommend, recommends the community mapping program that Jens Silke runs. Um, and I know Jens and Andrea and some others have also done a series of webinars um, for the department on a lot of these, a lot of different topics um, sort of beyond what we're discussing today, but it's a good research re resource, excuse me. Um, and then Jason just had a comment that it sounds like the bears, so again, talking about the windmills, he just wanted to comment that it sounds like the bears were avoiding the construction activity, but not clear that the installed windmills would cause the same problems from what you've presented. So I, I guess maybe a question there, Kim, for during construction, that's the impact, but then once they're there, is there kind of residual impact that's less or I guess? Yeah, it probably wouldn't be appropriate to make any kind of statement about that until the analysis is done. Uh, clearly, it looked like they those two bears didn't hang around during construction, but to suggest that that's the reason we're not really sure at this point. Um, and but that's what we're that's what we hope to find out is was it the construction activity that might have influenced bear movement? And once the windmills are built and functioning. Will that impact bear use of the area? And those are the two outcomes, uh, maybe one, two of the outcomes. There'll there'll hopefully be more um, that will come out of that that report. Great, thanks, Kim. Um, question from Stuart: um, Does riparian buffer restoration conflict with river corridor has hazard management, where river management now includes the concept of giving rivers unimpeded access to their floodplain to allow rivers to establish an equilibrium pattern of meanders and erosion, erosion slash deposition process. Yeah, I mean, Bob, you can comment on this also. I, I Not at all. I mean, I think that, that they complement each other and um, hopefully uh, some buffers, if, you know, some buffers on those restored rivers uh, would just be even more beneficial to um, a wide variety of wildlife. Great, um, super. Well, I think that kind of brings us to the end of our, our questions. Um, so 
Bob and Kim, thanks again for really great uh, time. And uh, thanks. And Caitlin, thank you for, for hopping on, uh, joining us as a panelist. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Caitlin. I didn't really mean to put you on the spot like that, but I appreciate your help. Oh, it's all good. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, great. All right. Well, thanks everyone again. And um, we will follow up with an email. And in the meantime, have a, a great week. Thank you guys. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank thanks, you, everybody. everybody.